Thank you. Thank you, Nikki. Welcome. Thank you um, for having me. Yeah, it's a pleasure to. Um, so I'm going to start as usual by uh, introducing our speakers. So um, Nikki De Bruin. So it said that you have um, started in business in L&D, uh, learning and development, lots of um, experiences in the real world, as I yeah. like to call it. <laughs> um, and then you got um, you also did um, um, an MBA. So real background in business, and then you discovered behavioral science, <laughs> um, and you came here. You are um, alumni here at, at Kingston, yeah. and um, and uh, and you saw the potential. Absolutely, so, uh, I understand. <laughs> and now you work with Corey Consulting. Yes. And so you bring your business acumen with your understanding of behavioral science to um, spread the good word about why we need science and behaviors at the same Absolutely. time. Absolutely. Well, welcome. Thank, Thank you for you. coming. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Gail. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for having me today. Um, it's really lovely to be here. Um, behavioral science is something that I am incredibly passionate about. And um, what I'm going to share with you today is one tiny aspect of what we do at Cowrie, and it's the kind of main area that I'm involved in, which is essentially working with our clients to establish what we call behavioral science centers of excellence. And the, the background to this is really that um, we see behavioral science as being something that should be almost like agile in a business where people are using it in their workday all the time. So it shouldn't just be limited to a particular area or a particular skill. It should be everyone applying behavioral science and thinking in a behavioral science way when they approach, um, when they approach their work. So today I'm going to just do a quick introduction to let you know um, who Cowrie is that I work for, just so that you have an understanding of what they do, so that that gives you a little bit of context. And then I'm going to talk to you about how and the, the methodology that we've come up with um, to build a behavioral science center of excellence with our client organizations and then we'll have some time for questions and discussions um, and there are some application examples where we've worked with clients so I can talk to you a little bit about how we what we've actually done with um, some of our clients out there so you can see um, get kind of an idea of how we we use behavioral science with our client companies um, so I don't need to introduce myself because Gail has um, told you all about me um, the only thing is is that I head up the academy um, at Cowrie which essentially means that I support our clients in building internal behavioral science capability. So a little bit quickly about Cowrie, because I know you don't need to know about this, but essentially Cowrie focuses on kind of making experiences either with colleagues or with customers um, much more human. So, so much um, of the stuff that we do with organizations, whether we deal with organizations as a customer ourselves or whether we're dealing internally, is very transactional. And what we kind of focus on is easing those experiences and using, those exper using behavioral science to make those experiences much more fluent, whether you're dealing in Internally, or whether you are talking to uh, talking to your clients. We've worked with lots of different organizations, so across different industries. We're not kind of focused on one particular industry. We started out in financial services, so very much used to working in those highly regulated compliance environments, which is not always easy. Um, uh, and, um, you know, you want to be creative, but you're kind of limited about, uh, rightly so, by things like the Financial Services Authority, et cetera. Um, so we've worked with financial services. We've worked with Amazon, with uh, physical spaces as well. So we've worked with Waitrose, with Tesco, looking at how do you apply behavioral science kind of within physical spaces to direct behavior um, kind of in, in a way that makes it much more easy for customers to interact with products, for example. We've also done um, quite a lot of work with um, British Gas recently. Um, you know, they've obviously had quite a tough time as an organization with gas prices going up, It's not, which is out of their control. And they've had to kind of deal with that internally and with their customers. So we've done quite a lot of work um, with them recently as well. Um, so that just gives you a little bit of an overview of the, the breadth of organizations that we worked with. Um, and who are the people that work at Cowrie? So 
essentially everyone who works at Cari has either got a psychology or a behavioral science or a data kind of science background. So um, I think there's very few people who don't have a master's. Um, and so we and we kind of take on new recruits each year through our summer school program so that we're constantly refreshed with kind of new um, research um, that is out there in, in the real world. So everyone is passionate about behavioral science. I'm the oldest, probably one of the oldest there. Everyone's very young. Um, but, you know, we can always reinvent ourselves at whatever age. So that was me. I pivoted my career, um, as Gail said, kind of coming from L&D commercial, working with the online environment um, into behavioral science. Um, and I absolutely love it. So what does it mean when we talk about building a behavioral science center of excellence. And essentially the core of this is, like I said, we we believe that, that our clients shouldn't rely on us forever to kind of rewrite their emails, for example, or to redesign their UX front page of, of a website that essentially what they should be able to do is be thinking in a way that incorporates behavioral science principles to identify any of those psychological barriers or pain points in any customer or colleague experience. So we like to work, we, we like to kind of, the, the center of excellence is really kind of a three to five year program where we work with our clients because, you know, some of them are big lumbering organizations um, to really instill behavioral science and get it used across the organization. So that's what building a behavioral science center of excellence means for us. And we've come up with a three stage process um, in order to embed BSI across organizations. Um, and essentially, there's three areas. Um, Conveniently, all starting with P's because we like things that are neat and tidy, and we also like things that come in threes, as a lot of you will know. Um, from a persuasion perspective, there's been lots of marketing research in terms of the power of three. So there are those three things up on the board, which you might remember really clearly afterwards. So people, purpose, and process. So when we speak to a, an organization and they say to us, we want people to use behavioral science in our organization, we say to them, right, these are the three things that we would recommend you focus on, and you need all three of them in order to actually really embed BSI um, into your business. So I'm going to look at each of these kind of individually for you. And then at the end of that, I'm going to show you some examples of application um, at, at the different levels that we've worked with um, with our clients. Um, so let's first look at people. So what does this mean? So we know that we can't do anything without people. Yes, data is amazing and machine learning and chat GPT is amazing, but we still need people to drive usage and to drive engagement, um, you know, with our organizations, with our colleagues, with our clients. So what we've come up with is this kind of, uh, the, the, there's these three areas that, that we feel organizations need to focus on. Um, and at the heart of it, you've got this behavioral science center of excellence within the company. And around that, we've got behavioral science champions. And then sitting around that even further are your behavioral science kind of consultant expertise. And I'm, I'll take you through each of these to tell you what, what, what we mean by them. So within, if you think of kind of a massive big financial services or banking organization, for example, um, you could have this core of people who, who need to drive behavioral science at that strategic senior leadership team level. Because without that SLT buying or without strategy buying from your C-suite, it's not gonna filter down. So essentially what you need, you need a behavioral science center of excellence that's led by one or two people that either have like a master's in the program or have been through courses, for example, or have experience in applying behavioral science because you don't always need to have the kind of academic background to it, but you need to understand what behavioral science is in order to see the benefits of how it can drive um, within your organization. So that's kind of this core, the, this core of, 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 of who will drive the behavioral science center that makes sense. But as we know, it's no good having one person in an organization who's passionate about something. So essentially what we've come up with is around this this person or these kind of few people who are sitting um, at the at the at the center. You need to have behavioral science champions. And that's kind of what a big role of, of mine that I play at Kari is we've developed programs where we go into organizations and skill people up in understanding behavioral science. So we have kind of a three suite program that people go through in order to really gain an in-depth knowledge to understand how BSI can be applied to benefit colleagues and customers. Um, and one of the kind of key things that we always come back to is, you know, 
behavioral science in business is not just about the organization because like with anything if it only benefits one party you're not going to have any long-term relationships so if you do bsi to kind of just get what you need as an organization you know you're going to be found out um so whatever you whenever you know one of the big things that we always teach people when we teach them about behavioral science is it has to benefit both parties whether that's organization and colleagues or whether that's organization and your and your customers it has to be beneficial to both of you otherwise it's not going to work so it's not about manipulation we re- we have our own ethical framework at Cowrie that we go that 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 we that we kind of adhere to really really strictly we're very this is not about using a, a, a behavioral science um to manipulate or to get something only for one side of a party because that's not a sustainable business model um uh so we have these champions and essentially what we then say to organizations is build your champions start getting them across functional areas so instead of you know so that you have in marketing you've got um behavioral science champions in compliance in safeguarding um you have in risk management for example whichever the organization is you need champions to drive the use of bsi principles but who understand it enough that they can recognize opportunities where behavioral science could benefit a particular process for example so they be able to say right there's a blockage in this um uh in this journey in this customer journey for example there's a blockage people are getting stopped here um whether they online for example or whether they're getting emails or letters people are getting blocked here why are they getting blocked what is the psychology can we analyze what the psychology is behind why people are stopping at this p- part of our journey they they've kind of come this far and then they they're leaving the website for example and why are they doing that and we have a process that we work with our customers to do that these guys are trained by us in order to to identify those kind of um areas uh where be sat and be applied to kind of ease processes um and then essentially sitting outside of that is a behavioral sciences consultants expertise so that could be carry it could be another uh be side consulting firm but essentially we don't expect organizations to have the type of in-depth expertise and knowledge that a consultancy gains by working across so many broad different industries you know and and carry we split all of our roles into you know we've got behavioral architects who focus on strategy um and using behavioral models like combi and theory of planned behavior and all of those things they focus on that and using biases to 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 um craft language but then we have behavioral designers because we feel at carry that perceptual design and perceptual psychology is as important in term in to to drive behavior so it's not just about language or models it's about what's the design elements you know what are we drawn to what makes us click a button for example what colors will make us feel calmer so we have behavioral designers who understand perceptual psychology who can also then support our customers and our, our, our clients in designing correspondence communications ux physical experiences using visuals and perceptual psychology as well um, and then we also have experimental designers and they're the guys who design the tests to make sure that what we set out to do is actually getting done um so we don't kind of expect organizations to go to that degree of expertise and that's why we kind of have that kind of pink band around where for big complex projects over the at the end of that kind of 3 to 5 year period they would still come back to us um so that's the who the purpose and this is very much aligning with each organization we work with so we kind of say to them where wh- what do you want to do with behavioral science in your organization how deep do you want to go do you want to rely on external consultants you know if you want to do that then that's fine we don't mind doing the work for you um in which case they would say right i want external bsi um but generally what what we want people to do is have that internal bsi capability and high application on their own at the end of 5 years so you're moving from we go in there we we do the proof of concept for them because as you know behavioral science is still relatively new and unknown to lots of organizations so when we start working with companies we start on a very small project that is measurable so that they can get that internal proof point to then go oh, okay this stuff actually works this is really good and then they can take it from there but essentially you kind of start in that in that bottom left hand corner with low application done by consultants and at the end of the 3 to 5 year period where you want to get to is that is that is the top right quadrant So that sounds all very lovely um but how how do we do it oh sorry what's the process um and how do we actually achieve that with our customers um so what we do is we've got a 
another three-step process, all with A's this time, um, is audit, align, and action. So essentially the audit is, and I'll show you now, is we assess where our customers are right now on the proofing ladder, which I'll talk you through in a minute. Um, and then we align with them. So we say, right, how much behavioral science do you want to embed across your organization? How, how far do you want to take this? Um, and then we develop a roadmap for them. So again, like this is what we've recently done with British Gas. We were also working with with um, a number of other banks and working with Asian Development Bank as well, developing a roadmap for them based on this audit. We kind of say, right, this is where you are. This is where you want to get. Here's a roadmap for the next kind of two to three years. Um, and I'll talk you through what that roadmap will look like now. Um, so this is the proofing ladder, which is featured in Ripple, which was written by um, Jez Groom, who's the CEO of Kauri, and he came up with this, this kind of proofing model. Um, and essentially, it goes from the bottom up, um, which kind of is slightly intuitive. It's better on the next slide. You can see it's slanted. But essentially, it goes from the bottom up. But we use this, this, proofing, mod, this proofing ladder to design the roadmap to kind of bridge the behavioral gap between where companies are now and where they want to get to from a behavioral science um, perspective. Um, and what we do, this is this is kind of part of the audit, and I think it's going to flash in. Oh, right, so let's go. So we've got our pilot, which is the what I mentioned to you in the beginning. Um, so our pilot project that we do with, with companies is all about getting proof of concept. We choose a small project we, that's measurable. It might be kind of, you know, the number of click-throughs that people are getting on a particular thing. And, we want, and so we can measure it beforehand. We can measure it afterwards. Um, and we can then say, right, this has actually worked or, um, or not. Um, but most often it does work um, because it is, you know, we are, we are kind of robust in our processes. So that's the P. There's the pilot. After that, we get recognition. And this is key because if you don't get recognition both internally and externally, people, organizations don't seem to get behavioral science to stick. So what we do internally, for example, is once you've got their proof point, we arrange roadshows throughout the company to go and talk to different departments to say, this is what's happened. This is how behavioral science has helped us. And we, we get the people within the organization to do that. So it's not us telling people, it's actually them saying, this has worked for us, this has worked for our department. And equally, we'll enter kind of external awards as long as we have measurable outcomes so that the organization gets recognized for applying behavioral science as well. Um, so that's the, the, the recognition element of it. The third element is operationalize. And this is kind of then moving out into other domains. So, for example, we might have first started on a UX project. Now we might move into a customer experience project. So it's kind of now spreading this out into different um, different operational areas within the business. Um, and then organizationalize, which isn't really a word, but anyway, it's another O which we needed. So organizationalize. Now this is kind of getting rollout in terms of other business units getting skilled up in 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 behavioral science. So we kind of move across. Um, future state, this is when we really start thinking about brand new products. So up to now, we've kind of essentially been working on what we call legacy, legacy business areas. So things that are already in existence, emails or customer journeys that already exist. But now a future state is thinking about how do we redesign a whole new way of working? So for example, a brand new referrals program, or how do we move from paper-based to paper-free? Um, Notice I said paper free, not paperless, because we, the power of free um, in behavioral science, we all love the word free. So <laughs> how do we move? You know, how do we migrate? Um, how do we do a digital migration? Those are big projects. That's kind of real future state innovation thinking. How do we redesign the way that we work? How do we redesign our stores, for example? Um, so that's future state. But no one, no organization is just going to go, oh, yeah, let's just move straight into future state when they don't even know the power of behavioral science. So you have to kind of go through through these levels and then we have in-house which really means that kind of uh, you know we're talking between hundreds of thousands hundred to thousands of people have been upskilled in the basic principles of BSI so it becomes an internal language where people can talk about behavioral science principles and at their meetings you know they they can speak about biases and how they're influencing the way that they work or the communications that they're putting out there Normalize is really just embedding behavioral science kind of right from an onboarding level. So when people join the organization, you know, they hear that this organization does behavioral science, but also at this point, we're looking at then all the work that's been done up this ladder. We've consolidated into kind of an internal hub 
So all of we, you know, when, when we work with customers, we'll do, we'll develop communications toolkits for them, for example, or engagement toolkits. And all of those things will sit on the behavioral science hub so that if anyone joining the company or if anyone's got a customer journey where they've had, you know, experienced a problem or a, a psychological barrier to people moving through that journey, they can go into the hub and kind of access information from there and share experiences that other departments have had with similar, with, with similar issues. Um, and then finally, if, the, if it's kind of relevant, this is kind of going group wide. So, for example, with British Gas Energy, we started with British Gas Energy. We are now moving across Centrica, the group, into British Gas Services and working with British Gas Services as well. So it's kind of this step-by-step -step process. And what's interesting about it is that it's not all, it's not all, linear so you don't always some some companies i'll just show you this is kind of our audit system so you'll see some companies like british gas for example they've got a star at group white because they've already started spreading up but they haven't completed four stars in all of the other areas so this is a really nice way of recognizing the great work that they've done at different levels but also of building the roadmap because we can then say for example at the pilot so we've got four stars at a pilot but we haven't done enough testing or experimentation and we need to do more testing with smaller projects to gain more proof points, for example. So this proofing ladder then guides the roadmap that we develop with our clients so that they can have a really kind of structured approach um, to achieving uh, whatever aligning with their strategies that, that we want to get to um, over the three to five years. Um, <clears throat> And this is just a visual representation of some of the organizations that we've worked with um, at kind of th that are at different levels. So, you know, we've done lots of different work with, you know, with all of those organizations and we have worked through it just to show you that I'm not just talking about theoretical stuff here. It really does work and we really do kind of um, approach our relationships with clients um, in a very structured way. Um, so. Just a few, I've got a few little examples for you here just to show kind of what I'm talking about and 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 how this all comes together. Um, but I think just before this, just to kind of explain a little bit about how from a consulting perspective we work with our we work with our clients. So let you know, if a client comes to us and says, right, I've got this, we've we've got a a website and we find that people are getting blocked at this particular area and they're not they're not moving through what what we would do at a kind of a, a legacy level is we would go in as an eat we've got you know different teams within the company and we'd assign that to a team and they go in and they do a full audit of all the current kind of it could be comms it could be contact centers it could be conversations it could be ux pages etc and they go to and do a full audit about what we call a behavioral audit of all of those different assets or touch points that you have in a particular journey and then what we will do is we will do a literature review as well. So if it's a particular type of thing, let's say it's a referrals program, we will go and do a literature review to go and see if there are any other kind of referrals, um, uh, academic research on referrals programs that's out there that we can use and apply. Um, we'd also go and look at kind of best practice. So we'd go and look at, we'd do a competitor audit and go and see kind of what are competitors doing with regards to a referrals program, for example, what works, what's, what, what, what might be working, what's not working. And with all of that information, and we then identify what we call the psychological pain points or the or the friction points within a particular journey or a particular process or an or a particular experience. It could be walking into shop and shopping, for example. And we'll identify the, the, the friction points or the barriers that are stopping someone from achieving a particular behavioral outcome. And we then go and present that back to the client. Before we try and fix anything, we go and present back the pain points because the clients can then say, well, actually, that we have to do it that way because of regulation or we can't change that because of brand guidelines you know those are these are things that 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 we kind of learn as we go through so we have this friction present uh, a feedback session with them um, and then once we've finished that we will then go away and we will then do what we call fluency and that's when we you know, kind of you know have lovely very creative exciting work to to address those psychological pain points so how do we apply behavioral science psychological principles uh, behavioral models how do we apply all of these things to address those particular barriers that are causing that um, that are causing blockages in behavioral outcomes and then we would present that back to a client we would then uh, the intervention would then get uh, put into place at the organization and we would then go back and test it. 
Um, so that's kind of the process that we follow um, with, with, with our partner clients. Um, so this is just an example of, of, of recognition. Um, this was some work that we did with the Phoenix Group that is, is really exciting, actually. One of, one of the big kind of areas that a lot of businesses are focusing, focusing on now is how you deal with vulnerable customers. Um, and so what, what we had kind of identified was how do you narrow that empathy gap between someone, for example, who's writing an email to a customer who might have a particular disability um, or might be disadvantaged in a particular way, how do you kind of narrow that empathy gap in their language that they use with their clients? And it could be in a conversation or it could be in an email. So we developed kind of an, 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 an e-learning experience for, for, for Phoenix, which has won this award. And, you know, one of the things that part of the, the, the e-learning experience does is, is create kind of in, an immersive environment where for example, I think it's I can't remember the exact kind of eye problem that 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 um, that a customer might have. I can't remember the name, but it might be macular degeneration. But I might be wrong. But actually, what it does is it shows you what it looks like that somebody who has that particular eye problem actually sees. So that when you're having a conversation with someone who says, "I can't actually read the website because I have this particular problem," they can empath empathize with them because they've seen what it looks like. They understand how difficult it is. So that was kind of one of the one of the things that we got um, external recognition recognition for. Um, Operationalized. So this was um, this was some work that we did with O2, and we had uh, 200 over, over 200 agents complete our foundation behavioral science and guide training, and this was kind of looking. What we did was we went in and listened to calls um, within contact centers at O2 and identified what experiences were from both sides. So what problems the actual call center people were having, because that's not an easy job, as we know. You often get shouted down in call centers, but also what problems were the customers experiencing. And we went in and listened to hundreds of calls to then analyze what were those barriers, what were the psychological pain points within, the, within those conversations. And we then designed a toolkit and a call guide for them that's not scripted. We teach the principles of behavioral science to them so that they can understand why having a conversation in a particular way might work or not work. Um, so that was kind of uh, going uh, across different areas within um, within O2 and then organizationalized. This was work we did with Tesco Bank. So you can see, for example, we started on kind of just commercial and regulatory comms with them, kind of how do we make those a little bit more engaging? Because a lot of the information in there is incredibly important, but people don't read it because it's cognitively overloading um, and it's just, you know, too much information. But we've extended and we've worked across, as I said, different areas with them. We've branched into um, customer relationships management. We've done insurance on their UX page and we've even spread out into colleague experience. Um, they've just recently done a whole new kind of process on kind of agile within within Tesco Bank as well. So it's looking about how do we encourage people to engage with 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 new things that the that the organization comes up with. Um, so that's was Tesco Bank. And then this is a, a video that I can show you. Am I okay for time still? Am I good? I know I wait, I whiz through and talk very fast. So hopefully you're <laughs> I'm not racing too fast. Um I'm gonna show you just a video that um of some work that we did with Tesco Bank, um, which is uh, getting paperless behavior change um with their clients. Anti funding marked a push for the paperless movement across banks in the UK. Tesco Bank saw this as an opportunity to create a better customer experience whilst reducing their operational costs and environmental impact by kickstarting paperless campaigns to their new and existing customers. I'm Sandra. I work in the comms team. The Tesco purpose is to serve our customers, communities, and our planet a little better every day. With that in mind, we had to look at the impact that we were having on the planet by producing paper waste. The strategy that we decided upon is to contact our customers, to engage them with digital banking, making sure that they were comfortable and at ease and confident in using it by asking them to opt in to going paperless. Customers in the past had been resistant to do that, so we had to make this an attractive proposition for them. Essentially, Tesco Bank wanted to increase the uptake of paperless banking across different journeys and touchpoints. 
To do this, they decided to work with Cowrie Consulting to embed behavioural science across their paperless campaigns and messaging to make it as impactful as possible. Our goal was to nudge customers to switch on their paperless banking as well as to test a different type of messaging that is most behaviourally impactful in driving paperless adoption. Cowrie began with a behavioural audit of existing communications to identify different psychological barriers in the language and design that might prevent customers from going paperless. Cowrie then conducted a literature review to identify further psychological themes that would influence customer behaviour in this context. From this, Cowrie worked with Tesco Bank to optimise the paperless campaign by embedding a total of 118 behavioural nudges across six different touch points and journeys. So we used a number of really interesting and robust techniques to support Tesco Bank with their paperless initiative. One of my favourite was the power of three. And this is a technique that's used quite often in political campaigns, advertising and public health and safety messaging. And it's really impactful because our brain can much more easily process information when it's presented in threes. And it's much stickier in our brains, so we're much more likely to remember it. And the reason it was so effective in this campaign in particular was because we identified three key behavioural barriers through our literature review. So we were able to develop three succinct benefit statements for customers to really get them to believe in the power of paperless to make it really impactful. The results were outstanding. With the use of behavioural science, the campaign achieved a 21% uplift in existing customers activating paperless and a 369% uplift in new customers opting for paperless banking at the point of sign up. This also led to amazing business outcomes. In just the first year, the initiative saved over £200,000 on print, 350 tonnes of CO2 emissions, which is equivalent to 1.3 million miles of driving, and over 185 tonnes of paper, which saved over 4,000 trees. We've embedded key behavioural principles into our subject lines, which see open rates increase from 25% to an average open rate of 51% across all paperless campaigns. Personally, I find the C factors a really useful framework for explaining the science behind what we're doing and why. We've taken insights like these and applied behavioural principles to comms projects across the bank. The success from this project has won the team an internal award for building a profitable, cost-conscious business and inspired a wider application of behavioural science at Tesco Bank. Since then, many colleagues have undertaken behavioural science training courses with Cowrie to adopt behavioural science as a way of working, so they can apply it across various different projects to drive better customer and business outcomes. We are absolutely filled with the results we've seen from our paperless campaigns, where we have embedded behavioural science principles. The results have been absolutely fantastic. Going forward, we can't wait to embed behavioural science within Tesco Bank and use it to develop further our paperless digital adoption activities, but also to help us develop and innovate new propositions across the whole of Tesco Bank. Thanks to Cowdy for all their work. It's been fantastic. Brilliant. So hopefully that's given you a little bit of an insight of the kind of type of work that we do, but also how we are really robust about measuring the impact. You know, it is it is incredibly important to us, but it also just shows you kind of the breadth of how we started in this one area and how that spread across um, the organization. Um, this was a, another really interesting project that we did um, called, it was a, this is a future state project. So the F under the proofing ladder, this was with the large online retailer. And for those of you who um, know about the behavioural model called COMB. I don't know, it's a big one that UCL use, for example. That's the kind of, their entire master's programme is very centred on, on, on COMB because uh, the academics there wrote the book and came up with a model. And um, it is one that we ha we use a lot at Cairo. We find it really interesting and we find it really broad. Um, what's nice about Combi is that it also links into, uh, it suggests kind of interventions that tie in with the different kind of um, uh, areas that you've identified need to be addressed. Um, but we, so we, in fact, I'm, I'm not, this is wrong, we had another um, characterization that we used Combi for and we didn't use Combi for this one. The, what we use for this one, which is one you might all be familiar with, is technology acceptance model. Um, and I actually use that model on my um, dissertation here at, um, at, at Kingston. Um, and we used, because this was a technology driven project, we used technology acceptance model to categorize different behavioral segments. So instead of doing a demographic segmentation, for example, what we find is much more useful for clients is doing a behavioral segmentation. So segmenting people in terms of how they behave or interact with a particular 
um, UX, or in this case, with a particular website. And then you can address your communications or your messaging to groups of people who behave in a particular way, not assuming that everyone, for example, who is 55 plus behaves in a particular way, or everyone who is 20 plus behaves in a particular way, or everyone who comes from a particular suburb behaves in a particular way. It's, it's, it's segmenting people according to behaviors. And, we, and this is the behavioral models that, that you know that, that that you learn at university are incredibly useful for identifying these behavioral segments. So technology acceptance model, which is all about usability and usefulness, that's how we categorize these these. Well, that's how we came up with these different categories, combined with the data that we got of, about the um, how people were using this particular website. So that was very future state, and then saying to them right after, now that we understand you have all of these different segments. Um, of users, how do we address them and get them to engage better with different parts of your website based on the existing behaviors, not based on their demographics? So that was a really exciting and interesting project that we worked on. And then in-house, um, I think I've kind of mentioned that we've done lots of work with British Gas. So this is really, we've done kind of a bespoke uh, communications framework for them called Solve. And this was um, in, in their contact center where we actually, uh, we, we went in and again, listened to all of their calls, came up with a kind of toolkit to guide them through how to have better conversations and then trained the supervisors in all of the different contact centers to be able to teach their staff and their colleagues how to to use these principles and that was um, kind of we've reached over a thousand people through that um, we now have in fact more than 29 masterclass scholars we've got 40 masterclass scholars um, across British gas energy and we've now start focus groups with them where all of those kind of champions those behavioral science champions have six weekly meetings with us where we talk everything beside or they talk you know what's so interesting is you'll find someone in one department going we're doing this and then someone in another department saying oh we're also working on that project Project, but they, they they haven't had a conversation with each other. So it's almost like behavioral science is kind of uniting them in their conversations, which is really fantastic to see. Um, and then, yeah, 200 contact center team leads trained um, in behavioral science as well. So it's really kind of spreading, spreading across. Um, and then normalize. So this is, um, this is uh, we've got colleagues at Aegon, over 500 um, people have been trained in Behavioral Science Foundation. This is quite a quite a while ago already. It's been rolled out about, about across all functions. It's part of kind of people who join the organization now. It's part of the colleague onboarding. And I've got another final video, and then it's question time, um, just to, uh, to listen to Colleen, who's talking about what we did with them at Aegon. Again, just to give you insight about how we work um, with businesses. In 2015, the Pensions Freedom Act changed the way companies offered their financial services. There was opportunity for companies to win customers or potentially the risk of losing them. And we had some conversations with Aegon how we could practically apply behavioural science within their contact centres using behavioural science to employ their customer and employee experience. So what was great about employing behavioural science within the contact centre was it improved the customer experience, but also the employee experience. So we saw the NPS scores increase, the customers, but we also saw the employee engagement scores go up because they were just having better conversations. And, and the outcome uh, for the business was amazing. You know, the commercial results uh, were really, really effective. So quite simply, the changes that Carrie made to the scripts took these quite complex pension sort of language and just made it far more simple uh, and easier to understand for customers. Carrie began by auditing Aegon's original call scripts to identify the point of cognitive friction before applying behavioural science to make their conversations more human. Carrie is fundamentally changing the nature of conversations. We frame the conversation the way that makes sense psychologically. These really are life skills that we're learning. To show that the new scripts worked better, employees were split into two groups. Group A kept their original call scripts. Group B was given Carrie's optimised scripts and their investments increased by 61%. My experiment tests the feedback and change. The more fact-based you can be, the more people get behind it. It's the best six months that we've had at Aegon. The Winning Conversation programme was rolled out straight away and across all contact centres. Carrie gave Aegon's employees skills training and that helped them navigate the world of behavioural science and help them go off script. Also, Carrie redesigned their screens to increase processing fluency and support phone conversations, such as icons and specific colours to stimulate a positive emotional response. 
So I'm going to delight you by the impact that this has had, not only on our people, but on our customers too. It's fully integrated, richer, better informed conversations. People feel empowered and our workers happier. It's also improved employee experience, decreased absenteeism, decreased churn, and also decreased the costs of recruitment and training. Employee engagement is at the heart of customer advocacy and has been key to our success. Initiatives have included NPS as a target for individuals, the C-Factor competition, Aegon Locks and our NPS awards celebrate individuals who deliver great NPS results. So what we found were that teams were actually competing against each other and that's what delivered the best NPS results. Brilliant. So I think the one thing that probably in both videos they mentioned, which I haven't mentioned, are C-factors. Um, and C-factors are essentially the behavioural biases that we've identified as being having the most impact within the business environment. So if you Google kind of how many biases, behavioural biases there are, you probably come up with more than 250. We've kind of narrowed that down to a bank of 30 that we use most often and we found to have the most impact. So that's kind of what we work with with, with our customers. So. On that note, um, I hope that's been really interesting for you um, and given you a little bit of an insight of the application um, that behavioural science can have within the business environment. Um, so, yeah, questions? <laughs> so, um, we're going to stop now the recording and then we're going to have the, the question in the room so that we can have a more of a free flow Amazing. of conversations. Lovely. Uh, but Thanks to everyone who joined online. Thank you for your uh, insightful uh, talk. <laughs> and okay. um, and now we can kind of revert to the uh, the real world. Brilliant. Uh, hybrid. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.